Good afternoon, and welcome to the Historical Society of Long Beach, uh, and welcome to the Auto Ep, as modern as today, Long Beach and the Electric Car. I'm Craig Hendricks, and I'm the Vice President of the Historical Society of Long Beach. And exhibitions like Chrome and the programs like the one, this one are made possible through the support of people like you, generous support of people like you. And today I would like to acknowledge supporters for the Chrome exhibit as the Port of Long Beach, the Hands On Real Estate Team. Price Almobilia, Best Hodges Foundation, Performance Plus Tire, Fix Me Knowles Car Wash, and Joan Van I'd also like to acknowledge uh, all of our Craft <coughs> Circle members. Uh, thank you for coming today. Um, and next, I'd I like to introduce our guest speaker, Larry Fisher. A native of Southern California, Larry Fisher encountered his first auto on the streets of Pasadena, as many of us did. Uh, in the early 1960s and had nearly forgotten the machine until coming across one in New England while hunting for a vintage motorcycle. <clears throat> his journey of discovery after rescuing his first auto has led him to, to become one of the foremost authorities on the subject of the American shopping car. Uh, Fisher became the founding board member of the historic uh, Electric Vehicle Foundation, whose museum now houses the majority of his former shopping car collection. Larry Fisher is the executive director of the National Hot Rod Association's Motorsports Museum in Pomona. Fisher's career has spanned the arts, culture, and motorsports, including the role of uh, Ultrasound Endurance Racing Team, Senior Fabrication Designer, and Project Administrator for the Walt Disney Imagineering. He has spent nearly three decades advancing, uh, experience, advancing experience design and interpretation in museums. Um, so with that, Larry Fisher. Thanks for coming to talk about shopping cars. <laughs> uh, before I got started, I, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about the first encounter with a shopping car and why it happened as, uh, as we were talking about them. My, my grandfather had a, a hardware store up in Pasadena on North Lake, and the <coughs> auto electric car dealership was on North Lake as well. And so when I was a little kid, we'd go over to my grandfather's house and we'd see these cars, as many of you did, um, bouncing around the neighborhood. And as I said, I'd almost forgotten it completely until uh, my wife and I went to a motorport hotel in the Catskills of New York. It was this old rundown hotel with weeds about this high. And there was a guy selling some old antique motorcycles, which is my other passion. And um, he was dragging me back through these little buildings looking at motorcycles and there was this 1953 Ottawa, all original paint, untouched. And I saw it and I kind of gasped. I said, oh my gosh, I remember those. And he said, oh, a friend of mine passed away and I'm closing out his estate. Do you want it? <coughs> and I said, yeah, how much do you want for it? And he says, if you can fit it in your trailer, it's yours. So my first Ottawa went home unexpectedly that day. And my wife was an enabler. Um, <laughs> she, she graciously allowed me to do it. Uh, after I got the car, I thought, well, I need to research it, being a museum person, you know. And I started doing research and digging around on the internet and looking for authorities like the Antique Automobile Association. <coughs> and everything I found was incorrect. The history was all jumbled up. It didn't make sense. People were given credit for creating these cars that didn't even come into the industry until 30 or 40 years later. And uh, so I thought, geez, I, I ought to start writing this stuff down and documenting it. And one thing led to another until I had a hangar with 36 of the cars in it. And, uh, <laughs> and I've been working on a book now for close to 15 years. Um, it was put on the shelf to write another book for, with a friend on golf carts. Imagine that. And uh, so now I'm picking it back up again. So it's really a great time to share some of the stuff I've learned. And um, I do want to recognize Pierre Ballard, who's, in, who's here, because his family, um, he and his brother and his father, were very instrumental in, uh, in the industry, and, and as you'll find out, uh, at the end of the industry as well. So, um, before we start, I thought we'd inject a little bit of humor with a music video. So, starring. <laughs>
Long Beach and the surrounding region here created kind of the perfect incubator for what would eventually become the shopping car industry. And Long Beach, the capital of that, uh, it was kind of a perfect confluence of climate, customers, and the aircraft industry, shipbuilding, people that had a background in manufacturing and creating. Uh, that boom was initially embraced by Long Beach and ultimately scorned by Long Beach, which led to its death. Um, now we're seeing another resurgence, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, at one time, and some may remember this, um, the development of the little cars were embraced to the point where Long Beach was the first community to put curb cuts in. And we think of that as a modern innovation, but they were actually put in to embrace these cars, uh, which one person reminded me were affectionately called custard cars. Maybe not affectionately. But um, the cars could drive up on the sidewalks, they could drive into stores, um, <laughs> and be used as a mobility vehicle as today. You can imagine the craziness that ensued with that. Uh, but eventually, regulation, uh, community pressure, and the influence of an editorial writer uh, for the Long Beach Telegram, George Robeson, uh, led to government regulation in the minds of cars. First being outlawed off the sidewalks and then outlawed off the streets. Um, ultimately though, as you'll see, the tables turned, but it was just a little too late. Um, before we talk about shopping cars though, we need to talk a little bit about how shopping cars came to be in the United States. Um, and for that, we have to go all the way back to electric cars. Um, a blacksmith in Vermont, a guy named Thomas Davenport, built the first <coughs> rotating electric motor in 1833. Um, I don't think of that like technology being that old, but he used that electric motor to power a model train. And then the whole thing kind of went on the shelf. Um, in the late 1830s, a Scottish inventor rigged an electric motor using that same design from Davenport in a carriage and powered it with batteries. And according to several key historians in the electric car field, um, that's really the first electric car. Uh, by the 1880s, though, the electric car sort of came into being. And experiments in electric cars resulted in a number of hand-built cars, um, bespoke models, and then commercialization. Uh, the EVs, electric vehicles, remained principal curiosities until 1897, roughly, when Pope Manufacturing Company uh, began to build electric cars. They were a successful bicycle maker, and, and they decided to get into the electric car business, and they created a car called the Columbia Electric Bay. That was the first production electric car in the United States. <coughs> What's interesting is, this same basic performance specification will come up over and over again. The Pope was capable of a top speed of about 15 miles an hour in a range of 30 miles. Um, within a couple of years, that idea had blossomed to the point where there was a whole array of carriages, buggies, trucks, wagons, all electric powered here in the United States. They were used primarily for local driving. Um, as the turn of the century approached, there were over a hundred manufacturing companies building electric cars in the United States. In, I think that's, yeah. uh, in 1900, 28% of the automobiles produced in this country were electric. Uh, you have to frame that though in the number of cars that were produced overall, which is about 4,200. <coughs> In, a year. <laughs> um, in the New York Auto Show in 1900, there were more electric cars than any other form of propulsion, gasoline, or steam, primarily. In New York City, uh, at the turn of the century, there were more electric cars registered on the road than any other form of propulsion as well. Even Thomas Edison and Henry Ford teamed up to build an electric car, and that's it. There are problems. And for those who can't see, that's the top one. Driving this. Yeah. Um, but technology didn't catch up fast enough. And even though the cars were popular because they were clean, and you have to bear in mind that this is at a time where the Model T Ford, if you were driving a Model T Ford, you had to be willing to get out and prime it 
prank a prank, it was not a clean or um, easy endeavor to drive your car. So electric car was actually quite popular because of its ease of, of use. Um, companies began to bring in to play a number of commercial models, but because of battery technology range and the lack of service facilities outside of city centers, the cars started to die off. And by the 1920s, uh, the uh, dead dinosaur powered cars sort of took over. Uh, so electric cars had their start. Along came World War I, uh, and the American shopping car has its origins just after World War I. Uh, in the United Kingdom and Great Britain uh, and in Europe, particularly following the war, there were a lot of veterans um, who had been injured and were returning home, and there was an interest in providing mobility. And so a cottage industry sprung up, first in Great Britain, building invalid carriages. And these are some examples of invalid carriages. And they ranged from what we would think of as a wheelchair today to hand propelled or foot propelled vehicles, um, hand cranks, uh, to gasoline powered and electric powered vehicles. Uh, in Great Britain, the invalid carriage was supported by a national scheme to provide the carriages through supplemental payments, or later on, actually providing them completely free of charge, and the user had to turn the car in at the end of its useful life. Um, so the invalid carriage industry had really blossomed in the post-war period, and this is um, this is an invalid carriage rally <laughs> in England. I didn't put the entire film up, but it just gives you a sense of the diversity of designs that were, people were coming up with to solve this problem. Uh, and you see here, hand-driven ones, gasoline powered ones, electric powered ones. Here in the United States, uh, a gentleman named Leonard Luzerne Custer was growing up uh, in Dayton, Ohio, and got to give you a little bit of background on Custer. Um, in 1899, uh, Custer, that's him, Leonard Luzerne Custer, in 1899, he was 11 years old, and his father, Levitt Ellsworth Custer, it's a little confusing, um, who was a dentist. Um, his father was an inventor. Um, he had pioneered x-ray use in dentistry. He had studied electricity. He created numerous devices, um, an oven for treating porcelain, uh, a gold annealer, a dental cabinet. He promoted the use of x-rays in dentistry, and he even included in his number of inventions a way to coat uh, platinum on dental work all using electricity. And at age 11, uh, Dr. Custer made an electric cart uh, with his son, Leo Luzerne Custer, at age 11. And that's the little car there next to the goat cart. Uh, it was a 32 volt battery that they made at home. They made the battery too. Uh, the vehicle, from the father's notes, the vehicle weighed 175 pounds of which the battery was 120 pounds. Uh, Eleven year old Luzerne was 65 pounds. Uh, and it went about 10 miles an hour uh, with a range of about 10 miles. And they built a charging system in their basement with a gasoline engine and a dynamo that 11 year old Custer actually could operate so he could independently charge the car and operate the car on his own. An article uh, in 1900 in a magazine in Dayton was titled A Clever Boy in His Auto Bain, and it featured the car and the story of young Custer. Uh, the little car was the first automobile registered uh, in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, so he mm. set a record with that. And it was the first automobile to be used commercially when a uh, dry goods purveyor named Fred Wright, he hired young Luzerne to deliver groceries for him using the car. Uh, as a teenager, Custer, young Custer, was thinking of products constantly. Like his dad, he was the consummate inventor. And he came up with things like a bicycle glider, an electric incubator, a two horsepower steam engine that uh, 
in his diary he said it should have blown up, but it didn't. And a hydroplane that he tried <coughs> flying on the Miami River, and it became a submarine. <laughs> but he wasn't deterred. <laughs> and so Custer uh, went on to attend Otterbein College and then MIT and graduated with degrees in mechanical and aeronautical engineering. Um, his father's interest in aeronautics and his friendship with the Wright brothers, who ironically lived over the back fence from him, uh, naturally led to an interest in aviation. And if you ever wonder who the third guy with the notepad is in the photographs of the Wrights at Kildeva Hills, that's him. Uh, he was the note taker for the Wright brothers. Uh, he was a member of the Early Birds, which is a pilot's association for people who had solo flown before 1916. It's a small club. And uh, he took his first balloon flight in 1909. These are some pictures of him flying his balloon. Um, but he flew the, flight, flew the balloon with a difference. This is a great insight into the Zern. He took along a printing press from the Dayton Journal <laughs> in the balloon along with a stamped letter. With help from balloon mates, um, he produced several editions of the journal, and they were printed in the balloon while flying and dropped over the soldier's home in Dayton. Uh, the letter was also dropped over Butler County, where it was picked up by a farmer, and the farmer took it to the local post office and it was delivered. Uh, it's a stretch to give him credit for the first air mail, but he was certainly the first person to, to deliver airborne mail. Uh, not to mention at first with a printing press in the sky, which is something that never really caught on. Um, but his interest in ballooning led him to a number of things. One was to join uh, the engineering club in Dayton, which was a, a very stellar organization. Um, his peers were Charles Kettle, the Wright brothers, um, Edward Deeds, who invented the electric gas register. Uh, and while a member of the club, um, he experimented with instrumentation for balloon flights, and he created a device called a statoscope, which is still in use today, uh, and it's to measure the rate of ascent and descent of aircraft. Uh, he didn't think the statoscope would be commercially viable, so he sold it um, to the United States Department of Defense and uh, forever regretted that particular move. In any event, um, going back, there's a funny story about Custer's inventions and unintended consequences. At the Engineers Club, he was always trying to come up with something that would actually make him some money. And so he developed a thing called a rotoserve, and he built a prototype and took it to the Engineers Club. And what it was was a rotating dining table that was electrified. And it had eight chairs around it, and you had a dining station and the buttons you pushed. And so if you wanted something that was at station three, you push your button and it would rotate around and your seat. And he thought this was the greatest thing, and his buddies at the Engineers Club thought it was the greatest thing, and he never sold one. Uh, but, <laughs> but he persevered. And World War I really brought the answer um, to his desire to manufacture something useful and meaningful for society. He was distressed by the coverage of soldiers returning from the war with missing arms and legs and disabilities, and he figured out a way for them to regain their mobility by creating his own version of an invalid carriage, the Custer electric car. Uh, there's kind of an interesting point here. When he first announced that he was manufacturing this new invention, he called it the Custer electric chair. And that didn't go over very well. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, he changed the name and he began to call them chair cars or custard chairs or custard cars. Uh, and on the right there is his first advertisement uh, for the custard chair. And I won't ask you to read the fine print, but um, kind of in the heartbreaking reality of the period, the Custer chair was quoted as, it will make you independent and self-supporting by enabling you to go downtown and sell small articles such as candy bars, shoestrings, <coughs> newspapers, etc. Uh, but in a, in what began to be a constant in his life, the unintended consequences were more viable than the intended. And while he sold, for the rest of his commercial career, he sold Custer cars, um, 
the majority were not sold for invalids, but ended up being sold as shopping carts. Here in the States, people recognized that it was an easy, clean way to get around, it took up very little space, and it was an alternative to either a full-size automobile or having a second automobile in your garage. Um, the cars sold for, between the wars, between World War I and World War II, the cars sold for between $250 and $600, which was a lot of money at the time. Uh, they were offered both in an electric model and a gasoline model. Uh, the cluster cars required a driver's license. Uh, they were quite popular in New York City in particular. Um, in the late 1930s, unaware of the need for a license, a double amputee, a guy named Chuck Hauser, knocked down a pedestrian in Manhattan. And since the pedestrian wasn't really injured, the police used the event to publicize the need for licenses, which ended up being the best advertising ever for Custer because he became commercially viable as a result of the publicity in both the Herald and the Tribune ran stories. And the resulting publicity ended up with the cars being successful commercially. Custer uh, wasn't limiting himself to just the shopping car. This is uh, some examples of his further evolution. He decided that because there was a market for shopping and for commuting, that he would come up with a car uh, that could be used for that purpose and wouldn't take up a lot of space. And you would think that the car was designed for children, but he actually designed it as a commuter vehicle. And he took the cars to the Chicago Auto Show in 1922. Uh, the Custer car, here on the top right, those were five feet long about two feet wide, high over the steering wheel. Um, and he premiered it at the Chicago Auto Show, and Elsie Zajac, who was the lady driving the car, um, drove a display Custer from the show floor into an elevator through the lobby mm -hmm. and out onto the streets of downtown Chicago. Um, while he intended, another unintended consequence, intended the cars to be a commuter vehicle for adults, and it was designed to fit through a doorway, uh, Instead, what ended up happening is he started to market them to children. And he marketed an electric version to younger children and a gasoline power version to older children. Mm -hmm. And in the bottom right is Shirley Temple driving a gasoline powered Custer. Mm -hmm. um, he had success selling the Custer cars, but real success didn't come until he got the idea to put a circular bumper around the entire car and sell them to amusement parks. And that ended up being his biggest success. Uh, <laughs> the company was then called the Custer Specialty Company, and from that point onward, most of what he occupied his time inventing and manufacturing were amusement rides. Um, it was the first domestic amusement ride manufacturer in the United States. Some of his patents include the bubble bounce, which we think of as the tilt a world now, you know, where you spin and it tilts. Um, an airplane ride at Coney Island called the Zoomer that was a simulated airplane ride on a spinning carousel. Um, a vehicle called a Sea Cycle, which was a bicycle for use on the water, and a paddle about. Um, he made a number of innovations and, and amassed dozens of um, patents related to amusement park rides. He also um, invented a scooter with a centrifugal drive uh, that was later he licensed to Cushman and that patent was then cited in the first automatic transmission in an automobile. Mm -hmm. So he was a pretty advanced um, inventor but never really got the credit that he was due. Mm -hmm. um, during World War II, and this comes in later with the shopping cart industry, he also turned his interest in taking the technology he used for the Custer cars and adapting that for use in defense plans. And that created the Custer Common, which you see in the bottom left, which is really the, the precursor to um, what you would think of today with the, you know, the two-wheel stand-up type of vehicles, like a Segway. Um, Custer passed away in 1962. Um, he actually took a jet flight uh, in a fighter jet the year that he passed away because uh, he'd always wanted to be in a jet and that was one of his 
bucket list items before he passed on. Um, and then his wife continued to run the company for another three years, and it was destroyed by fire. But Custer's dedication to making life easier through technology and through the creation of these cars is really what kind of set the mark for what happened here in Long Beach. So, I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about Robert Taffel, and then we'll bring the two together. Um, Robert Taffel was born in 1891 in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, he was the son of a guy named Herman Taffel, who owned the Edison Electric franchise in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, in those years, if you owned an Edison franchise, it was a license to print money, because you not only provided the electricity, but you had the license to sell all the appliances that went with it. Uh, so his father was doing rather well, and Robert and his brother Paul uh, were both being raised with the expectation they would stay in the family business, and so they both went to school and studied electrical engineering. While a student at Purdue University, um, Robert's father passed away unexpectedly from heart failure in the store, uh, and at age 23, his life was changed forever. Um, Herman Taffel passed away at age 47, leaving his two sons and his daughter in charge of the business. <clears throat> this was a year before Robert was scheduled to graduate, so he continued in school with the expectation that he and his brother would work together in the family business. And in 1915, um, he graduated uh, with a degree in electrical engineering and returned to Louisville to share in the family business. But sharing responsibility with his older brother just became increasingly difficult. So in 1919, Robert convinced his mother and his sister to invest in him starting his own business, and they incorporated Taffel Engineering, and his mother and sister contributed $5,000 to the venture. <coughs> A year later, uh, Robert married Helen Hunt Andrews. Um, she was the head of social services at the city hospital at Louisville. And Robert began, through her, to look at creating solutions for the infirm uh, through the hospital, using his newfound business. Uh, they worked on a number of different ideas, including a more traditional electric wheelchair with the drive in the back. Uh, but at his in-laws coaxing, Robert and Helen moved here to Long Beach, California in 1936. Uh, this is a picture of them, the family, and workers at the company's store in Louisville. Mm -hmm. And then they moved to Long Beach. So in 1936, um, he moved in with his in-laws. Uh, the couple lived on East First Street. And Helen's father, uh, Charles Andrews, helped Robert set up a small shop at home. And soon after arriving in California, he encountered his first Custer car. And after he looked at the car, he decided he could build a better mouse. Uh, this is the actual car uh, on the top left, and that's on the Long Beach Pike, and it's a Custer chair car. Um, and it had been modified by this gentleman who was injured in the war uh, so that he could operate a sharpening business from his car. Mm -hmm. And so using the electric power in the car, he had mounted a second electric motor with a grinding wheel, as you can see there, mm -hmm. and he would pedal the sharpening services for scissors and knives and so forth um, along the pipe and throughout Long Beach. The Custer car, though, was a mechanical nightmare. It was a shaft-driven vehicle with a big gear drive and quite complex to manufacture, required a lot of specialty parts to be made, um, and they were very expensive for the time. So Robert started working on an alternate to that car, and in 1938, he applied to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office with his design for the Ottawette. And you can see his first Ottawette there on the lower right, in the same location. Um, and you can see the cars were somewhat similar, but the Custer version being much more complex um, and the Ottawette being much less complex, the Ottawette sold for about half of what the Custer sold for. Uh, he started advertising in 1938, and his first ad in Long Beach Independent came out in 1939. And these are some of the first cars that he manufactured. Uh, 
the three of those shots are in his front yard, and the bottom left one is at the Memorial Auditorium down on the waterfront, which was his favorite spot for many years to shoot pictures of the cars for pamphlets. Um, his initial success was great, and so in 1940, he moved to Taffel Engineering to their first official location, 1121 West First Street. And 1121 was the home of Grosbeck and Nelms. They were boat builders, and he had been having them fabricate parts for his cars, and so it was kind of a natural relationship uh, to move in there. Um, he began marketing the first three-wheeled vehicles, and then he opened another shop on Wake Court uh, for the purpose of selling the vehicles. This is his first advertisement, and uh, it was also where we were inspired with the name of the presentation today, because he created the slogan in May of 1940, the new Ottawa, as modern as today. Um, you can see, though, that the approach to marketing them was still somewhat based on the Custer cars. Uh, don't be a shut-in. And the text talks about uh, being left out of activities, outdoor activities, you can see playing ball seated in your Custer car, or your, I'm sorry, your, your auto ed. Um, but the success was made. Now, Robert was your consummate inventor. He was more interested in inventing than he was in selling. And fortunately for him, um, he came into a relationship with a guy named Newton Blood. And that really put him on the map. And also gave him an opportunity to pursue some interesting projects. These are some photographs of a hybrid gasoline electric car that he designed in 1939. Um, he tried to sell the cars, but uh, they were not commercially successful. But um, it's interesting, his thinking, and in his notes, he talks about using the gasoline engine to drive on the street and then charge batteries from the motor. And then when you got to a store and you wanted to go inside, you shut the gasoline engine off, and you'd run the car on the batteries when you went inside the store. Mm -hmm. And you could drive the car inside. Another direction he went in was the idea of a more automobile-type car. Uh, and these are some pictures of prototypes that he built of a full-body version of the Ottawette. Again, these didn't catch on, and so the initiative was dropped. Um, but it's an interesting exercise in streamlined design for the period. So Newton Blood, um, he was born in Vermont. Um, he was kind of an interesting guy. He was a, a primarily a salesman. <laughs> he had a number of different businesses and um, a number of different jobs, but, and he bounced around New England. Um, he was married four times um, before 1940, and uh, he moved to North Dakota, he went back to New England, and ultimately, though, uh, in 1935, he moved to Fort Worth, Texas, <coughs> went into the scooter business, and this is his storefront in Fort Worth. Uh, he opened a scooter dealership under the name of Blood Sales, and for reasons we don't know, he decided that Texas wasn't for him, and it may have had something to do with his third marriage, um, <laughs> but uh, he ended up coming to Garden Grove, California, and on a visit to Long Beach, he saw an Ottawette, and he sought out Robert Taffel. Um, he presented himself to Taffel with an interest in selling Ottawettes, and soon after, Blood became the president and sales manager for the DNR Blacksmith Shop in Long Beach, and the DNR Shop became the first Ottawette factory. Um, Taffel ended up selling the Taffel Engineering and the Ottawette name to Newton Blood in 1941. Uh, and at the outbreak of war, um, Robert Taffel went to work for Douglas Aircraft and moved to Santa Monica and left the rest of the Ottawa legacy in Blood's hands. This is an ad for the 1941 Ottawa, and first ad under Blood Sales Company. Newton Blood, though, was a good salesman, 
And he started marketing the cars using some innovative methods. Um, he created a network of pharmacies all over the country, and they were shipping cars as far as Florida and New England. Uh, this is a car in Arizona, owned by the Domberg family. Uh, by the way, this, this particular car is a 1946 Ottawa and is still owned by that family. Uh, and it still runs. It's in excellent condition. We rebuilt the wiring on it a few years ago. Um, these are the first instructions uh, that they typed up for the Ottawa. And there's a copy on the table over there, but I find it fun when you read them that the very first instruction is how to stop. <laughs> With war uh, looming, Newton Blood turned his attention to the defense industry, and he got his first big order from Alcoa Aluminum in 1941. Uh, and this is the first half of the first order for Alcoa, uh, building a fleet of cars to be used in their aluminum extruding plant in Tennessee. Uh, but this really carried the business through the war, um, building cars for use indoors in aircraft plants and factories. Uh, and uh, the cars started to catch on in the movie business as well, selling them to the movie studios. Um, production of vehicles began to expand, and in the post war period, uh, they produced not only the Ottawa, but then what a model called Cruiseabout. Cruiseabout was an upscaled model that had a uh, removable convertible top, doors, and a nice trim package. Uh, they also made a quarter ton and a half ton pickup um, and a variety of custom body models, including a four passenger bus <coughs> and a tram where you sat facing outward and the driver stood in the front. Um, so there were a number of vehicles that he began to target um, to specific markets. Uh, but he, this gives you an idea of a little bit of the change here. These are ads from 1947 and the use of pharmacies to sell cars still. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in 1947, um, with a restyle of the car, it was featured in popular, in, uh, popular science magazine. And then again, in 1951, Popular Mechanics magazine was another restyle of the body. And these magazine articles really started to make cars successful as shopping cars. And you can see they moved the advertising to primarily women driving cars or elderly driving cars. This is some of the early advertising. That's a 47 as well. Uh, this is from the instructions on operating the vehicle, how to adjust the electric motor, and then the restyle of the new car in 1950 with a higher front end, and that became sort of the standard for the, for the auto web. Um, it's interesting that they were marketed as being from California. That was a big sales point. And here's another piece. 35 miles for three cents, the economy was a big selling factor. In 1954, um, it went all in, and Newton Blood entered the Ottawa and the Chicago Auto Show. And the main thing that happened there is, is that he created the dealer network. Instead of selling the cars through pharmacies, they actually started to establish dealerships. Um, dealerships like the one I mentioned in Pasadena. There were dealerships in Chicago, New York, uh, down in Florida, uh, in several areas in the Midwest, not too much in the South and not too much in the Northeast, probably weather related. Uh, but the dealership <coughs> network really started to make the company now much more viable, and so they had to expand their manufacturing capabilities. Uh, so in 1952, they sought out a manufacturing partner. And the manufacturing partner was a company called Wayne Manufacturing in Pomona. Uh, but before we go to Wayne, I'm going to dispel a little myth. <laughs> uh, there is a myth in the Ottawa world that the cars are powered by Sherman tank turret motors. Uh, and that's not true. It's a very romantic notion, but not true. Uh, 
From the very beginning, uh, Robert Taffel was looking for an effective DC motor uh, that he could use in the cars easily. And so he went to a well-established firm, Northeast Electric, in Rochester, New York. And they provided the motors. The motors were starter generators for Dodge trucks. And the first of them were delivered to Robert as starter generators. And then he would take the back of the motor off and rewire it. And then it would be used as a car motor. Later, as the cars became more successful and Newton Blood ran the company, he was able to order the motors from Northeast Electric, reconfigured for use in the cars. And as kind of an interesting side note, the car that's in the next room, I looked under the seat this morning and it has a Northeast Electric motor in it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the motors were basically unchained up until the early 1970s. And uh, they are unique in that the front of the motor has a big threaded snout on it that's specifically for putting the motor into a truck as a starter generator motor. And it's a feature of the motor that was never used in the auto app, but it just kind of hangs out there in space. Um, and it's a signature to how the motor would So we just dispelled a myth on the uh, Sherman tank motors. So I mentioned 1952. Uh, 1952 is kind of a pivotal year because although there were some golf carts prior to that time, they were generally bespoke. They were custom made. Um, they were not desirable at golf courses. Most golf courses did not allow golf carts. Um, they were afraid they would tear up the turf. And then in 1952, Ottawa introduced the golf mobile. And with a, a stroke of brilliance, um, Newton Blood went out to the Palm Desert, Palm Springs area, and went to the Thunderbird Golf Club and convinced them to lease a fleet of Ottawa golf carts and try them out. And of course the Hollywood set that would go out to Thunderbird, they loved them. And the celebrity endorsements started to add up. And you had folks like William Frawley, Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, Desi Arnaz, Lucy, um, even Harpo Marx uh, endorsing these golf carts. And so the golf cart craze put this huge demand on production. And in 1952, the Ottawa company, as I said, went to the Wayne Manufacturing Company in Pomona. Wayne Manufacturing produced street sweepers, and they uh, started building in a new 30,000 square foot plant that they acquired from the Salisbury Motor School, uh, Ottawa and Ottawa golf cars. And here's just a few of the celebrities. That's Eisenhower on the top left and the right, and William Farrell on the bottom left there. Life Magazine actually ran in 1954 a spread, a big photo essay on the golf cart craze, and it's hilarious to look at because it's just this army of golf carts invading the golf course. <laughs> um, so Gil Wayne at, at Wayne Manufacturing, um, he worked with, uh, with Newton Blood, and in October of 1959, Blood decided to sell uh, the Ottawa concern to Wayne Manufacturing Company. Um, three years later, Newton Blood passed away, almost three years to the day after selling the company. Gil Wayne, who owned Wayne Manufacturing, went to Henry Keck of Pasadena, who was a noted industrial designer, and had him redesign the golf cart and the uh, shopping cart, and came out with a new 1957 Ottawa, all completely redesigned and restyled. Um, you can see there some of the other options, the golf mobile and the delivery truck. In 1960, Wayne, I mean in 1961, uh, Wayne Manufacturing discontinued the auto wet line. It just wasn't selling. And at that point, things were starting to decline, which we'll talk a little bit about. But um, Wayne did continue manufacturing the golf mobile for another five years, um, and then discontinued manufacturing golf mobiles as well. Uh, it just wasn't profitable for the company. So there's a fellow that comes up in the history named Roy Sievers. And Roy Sievers was born in Colorado, moved to Nebraska, and at age 19 he enlisted in the Army. Um, 
He served in the Panama Canal Department in 1946, um, and he and his wife and son moved to California in 1950, um, and they settled here in the Long Beach area. And in 1956, whoops, what that is. But they'll remind us tomorrow. There we go. Um, in 1956, he went to work uh, for a company called the Electric Car Company of California, a competitor to the auto ed. Um, Royce was a welder there, and he was a natural salesman. And what ended up happening is history was very favorable to Royce Sievers, um, in part because of the way he marketed himself. But uh, in 1959, he went to work for Ottawette Electric Car Company as manager. And then when the Wayne Company discontinued producing the line, uh, the brand was sold to the then partners in Ottawette Sales and Service, which was a guy named Dale Brown, Ed Sheridan, and Roy Sievers. Um, and they all were headquartered at 521 Long Beach Avenue, uh, formerly American Avenue. And in 1969, um, Sievers ran the business then until 1969, um, and he left the business, uh, and in 1971 he passed away. But in the process of doing so, he sort of cemented himself in the popular history as being the creator of the Ottawette, uh, which he wasn't. And it was kind of interesting to, uh, whoops, um, to see how history was favorable to him simply because he told a good story. This is a dealership at 521 uh, American Avenue, and that's Roy Sears on the right. And speaking of dealerships, this is the dealership in Pasadena on North Lake. And you can see that they were not just carrying auto ads, but they also sold and um, used and, and reconditioned other cars. And then this is an example of a variety of, of auto ads. Um, the Wayne version of the auto up in the top left and the prior version, prior to the 1957 version on the top right. Sorry, the Wayne on the left. Um, now, there's an interesting point that will come up later, but before we talk about Harry Benison, along with Roy Sievers working for the electric car company of California, um, another gentleman, Wilford J. Ballard, your dad. <laughs> uh, he worked in 1955 as a salesman for Ottawa. And then in 1959, he moved over to the Electric Car Company of California and began working there as an assembler. And that, those connections to the Ottawa Company come into play later, as you'll see. Uh, so the next competitor to Ottawa, or um, to jump into the fray, was electric car sales and service with Harry Benison. And Harry Benison uh, was born in 1891. He was a bit of an adventurer. You can kind of tell by his picture there. He had a little bit of an attitude. Um, and uh, <laughs> at an early age, he was 16 in that picture. Uh, he was drawn to the sea. Um, he was from San Jose. He moved to San Francisco at age 16 and signed on board as a waiter on the Matson ship, the Lurline, which is pictured there sailing from San Francisco to Honolulu. Um, he really loved the sea and loved anything maritime. Um, he married his wife in 1915, and they had a baby in 1916. And for that reason, Harry was not drafted into World War I. Um, he was granted an exemption. So he went to work for a company called Simmons Manufacturing in San Francisco, where he worked uh, during the war and after. Um, with help from his employer, he went to the San Francisco Maritime Academy. And at the outbreak of World War II, he entered the Merchant Marine Service. And he served on the Liberty ship William S. Clark. And during his service, his wife and daughter moved to Long Beach to live with his in-laws, her parents, and Romeo Tarney and his wife Ada. And Romeo was a food agent here in Long Beach. But he also had a cottage business manufacturing wheelchairs uh, out of his garage. After the hostilities ended, Harry went to work helping with the wheelchair business about 1945. 
1947, Romeo Tarney passed away leaving the wheelchair business with Harry. At that point, Harry had seen these electric cars and with the information that he gleaned working at Simmons Manufacturing and, and throughout his career, he decided to go into the electric car business. And so in 47, he opened Benison Electric Car Sales and Service on 316 East 7th Street here in Long Beach. That's the first car that Harry built. Mm. And you can see its resemblance to the Ottawette, almost identical. However, Harry was uh, bent on making fine improvements to the cars. And so he invented his own switch system. He created a three-point suspension system so they would ride better. So it was an, basically an improvement over the Ottawette. And he called the car the Mobilette. Um, he produced only two versions, the Mobilette and the Porter Tum Pickup, although he would modify them on your request. Uh, in my collection, I had a Mobilette flower car that was used by a funeral company to deliver flowers. And it was modified with flower holders in the back. Uh, so he would basically produce them to your standard or to your needs. The Mobilette was not nearly the commercial success, nor did Harry want it to be. He kept the company small, uh, and he really sold the cars based on the improvements over the auto at his competitor. He changed the name of the business to Mobilette Electric Car Sales and Service in 1957 in order to distinguish his company from the other companies that were springing up, like Electric Car Sales and Service and Electric Car Company in California. Um, in late 1965, he ended up selling the business. Um, this is a picture of 19, roughly 1950, Harry on the left, in front of the storefront, from the Venison electric car. And here's an example of a mobile app. You can see very similar to the auto app, even in the way they were advertised, pricing and, and uh, accessories. Uh, although he was from the beginning, really going after the shopping cart business. Um, in 65, Harry sold to Elmer Woodring. Elmer Woodring had opened a company called Electric Car Sales and Service. Um, and he kind of carries the next chapter. In uh, 1977, Harry Benison passed away, um, and his legacy was somewhat lost. Uh, the, the mobile app being not nearly as well known as some of the other brands. The electric car company of California was at 495 Alameda Avenue in Long Beach. You can see there was quite a the Long Beach becoming the epicenter. Um, they produced the electric shopper from 1952 to 1964, and unlike some of their competitors, um, they set out right away to compete with the established market for Autoettes. The cars were not only virtually a copy of the Autoettes, but Elmer and his partner, Henry <coughs> Castile, uh, they even bought parts from Autoette for their cars. So the switches, um, a lot of the accessories were all purchased through Autoette and put into the electric, um, electric shopper. In 1959, both Thomas Zarp and Wilfred Villard Sr. Uh, went to work for Electric Car Company in California as assemblers and really began to learn the business. The two would go on to form B&Z Electric Cars, makers of the Electric King, uh, in late 1961. But they learned the business here, uh, manufacturing electric shoppers. Uh, a runabout, this car, that was called a runabout, had a 61-inch wheelbase. Um, they were steel. They similar 24 volt system to the Autoette tiller steering. Um, the doors were an option, uh, as was the part and the windshield was an option, and later turn signals were added as an option. In 1962, Elmer Woodring changed the company to electric car sales and service, and in 1965 he purchased Mobilette and added Mobilette to the line. The later models, of the electric shopper. Oh, here's this is a brochure showing the line of cars, and you can see uh, the tram type, um, the pickup, and the runabouts. One of the other things that um, 
that the um, electric car company in California was credited with is they established a relationship with the Trojan Battery Company. And Trojan Battery had been making batteries for autoettes and for other electric cars, but not a battery that was designed specifically for the odd charging and discharging cycle of these cars. And so they went to Trojan, and Trojan came up with a six volt battery, the Model T 105, um, which was a deep cycle battery and is the architecture for all deep cycle batteries, lead acid deep cycle batteries um, that came after it. Uh, and they still make the T-105 today, uh, which is kind of neat. If you have an autoette, you can actually get the right battery. Uh, so that became a part of the staple of their advertising was increased range. And at this point, the cars were capable of 18 to 20 miles an hour, typically, and had a range of 50 to almost 100 miles, depending on the <coughs> and the weight of the occupants. In 1961, in an effort to sell the car more as a car, and, and really as an alternative vehicle, they came out with the electric shopper um, in a new version with a molded fiberglass body and a faux grill, uh, kind of a sinister face. To it. Um, and the new car, uh, you'll see another one in a few moments, really was designed and marketed for short errands, uh, for use as an alternative to a second car. Uh, the steel version was a less expensive car, so they continued to sell them. Um, this car had a top speed of 18 miles an hour and a range because of its weight of about 30 miles per charge. By 1968, Electric Shopper brand, the Electric Sports Rider, and Mobilette were all absorbed into Woodring's electric car sales and service. And electric car sales and service was sold to Wilfred Pilar of BNZ Electric in 1976, ending the electric shopper. So there's another company that pops up here in Long Beach. It's um, quite a few. And that's the Marketeer. The Marketeer company is interesting in that it was the offspring of a successful scooter accessory business. Um, a guy named Eno Stavila, who had worked in Wilmington in the oil fields um, as a welder and fabricator, started a little business selling scooters and making accessory parts for scooters. Um, he actually started marketing a line of accessories for Cushman scooters, and Cushman sued him unsuccessfully. And he was allowed to continue to um, sell scooter parts for Cushman's, much to their dismay. And to get even, they started uh, shorting him on purchases from Cushman, causing grief with his customers. Um, but in the meantime, another gentleman named Merle Williams, who was from Redland, and Merle had a background in the recreation department, parks and recreation department. Um, at the outbreak of World War II, Merle moved from Redlands to Long Beach, California. And he went to Davila because his wife wanted something that she could go shopping with, and with gas rationing, and these other electric cars running around, Merle had the idea that maybe he could come up with a shopping car for her. So he went to Enos Davila's shop, and together they built the first marketeer. And it was a pretty crude machine, but it was completed in 1941, and uh, people in the neighborhood started to see the car and asked if they could get one built for them as well. Um, we received a bunch of requests to build them, and so he and Enos Davila sort of accidentally went into the marketeer business. And they called it the marketeer, which goes in line with the, sh the electric shopper because now they're really being marketed as shopping cars, <coughs> no longer as inventory cars. Uh, Davila and Williams first produced production cars in 1945. And they started producing the cars out of the shop. Uh, and then in 1950, uh, Merle Williams moved back to Redlands, and they separated on good terms, and Merle took the marketeer name with him. And this is a picture of the first car manufactured at the new Redlands facility. Uh, because they were good friends and it was an amiable parting, uh, Enos Davila 
changed the name of the cars that he was producing at the time to Marketeer. So they had Marketeer and Marketeer, the attempt being that they wouldn't compete. Mm. Uh, <laughs> however, <laughs> uh, at the Orange Show in 1950, they went up against each other and they had booths across the way from each other, mm. the two cars and the two different brands. So uh, they were still trying to make a go of it independently. Shortly after returning to Redlands, uh, Williams decided to expand the line, as had other manufacturers, and started producing industrial cars and golf carts. In 1951, he introduced his first golf cart, uh, and in 1965, he and Peggy sold the company to the Westinghouse Corporation. This is right at the peak of their manufacturing. One of the neat things about marketeers, they really did try to make some cars that were attractive and, um, and unique in the marketplace. This was the Californian model. Um, and then Mar Marquette, which is a little coupe. Um, I only know of two surviving Marquettes. And the Holy Grail, Wow, of shopping cars, the town to build, uh, which had real glass windows, not plastic, uh, and it had roll-up windows in the doors, and was really an electric micro car, wow. and it made the leap. Um, and uh, on an interesting side note that relates to the Lions Drag Strip exhibit, uh, the rear axles, the little differential rear axles, were four rear axles that were modified by a company called Curry, and Curry is still here in Long Beach, uh, modifying axles. And um, so they made all the axles for Marketeer. Marketeer was the one other big difference with Marketeer is they mounted their motors, it was a little bit technical, but they mounted their motors transversely above the axle, and then it drove directly to the pinion gear on the axle. So it got rid of all of the chain lash that was endemic in the other types of shopping cars. They were really a smooth running uh, car that was much more like an automobile. Mm. So Eno Stavila, coming up with a great slogan, he started marketing the market tour, um, and they were called the Queen of the Road, that was the motto. Uh, models included the Model E, that's what this one is here. Uh, and then um, those were available with soft and hard top versions. And they produced again a quarter ton electric pickup and a car called the Model I, which was similar to this with a smaller top and the back extended with a trunk. Hmm. Um, you know, Stavila only manufactured these cars um, for about six years and then sold his interest in the market tour. The Marketeer Company, I told you that they had gone on um, to Westinghouse, and Westinghouse continued to build uh, electric-powered golf cars, industrial cars, specialty vehicles, starting off with a three-wheeled car and then a four-wheeled car. And around 1967, um, they changed the styling in an attempt to continue to sell the cars and make a better um, go at the market. And by 1976, Westinghouse, which they had unsuccessfully tried to market a full-size uh, automobile that was electric powered. They had a fleet of them traveling around the country trying to sell the cars, mm. and that failed. And so they changed their corporate strategy and they sold off the <coughs> Westinghouse electric car division. What's interesting is, is when they sold off, the company went back to Williams briefly, and he got the company back for pennies on the dollar. <coughs> After a few months, that didn't work out. Westinghouse took the company back again. Uh, and they made Williams a little bit more wealthy um, by doing so. But in 1978, they found a buyer that was really serious, and that was Nordskog Industries. And Robert Nordskog um, had made his mark by being the inventor of the aircraft galley. You know the galley they walk through and bump you in the shoulders with? Uh, Bob Nordskog invented that and the kitchen that goes into an airplane and became very wealthy doing that. And he bought uh, Marketeer and he offered a model called the 
Model 450 Marketeer 4 runner, which was a four-wheeled car. One of its um, selling points was that it wouldn't tip over easily, and uh, continued to manufacture those cars from 1978 to 1982. And then Bob Nordstock passed away, and the company was sold to U.S. Electric Car. And just really quickly, U.S. Electric Car was already in the business of making electric industrial cars. Um, they, in turn, sold the company in 1996 um, to a company called Legend Electric Vehicles. And in 1999, Legend Electric Vehicles was absorbed by Columbia Par Car. And Columbia Par Car have made their money par par, selling golf carts. Uh, they had bought the Harley Davidson golf car brand earlier, in about 1982. And then they purchased Legend, merged the two, and Columbia Park Car, which is a division of Flambeau Industries, which is a plastics manufacturing company, um, and the makers of the Duncan Yo Yo. Let's put it in context. Um, Flambeau Industries still owns what remained of the Marketeer Company, uh, and they're headquartered in Reedsburg, Wisconsin, and they're still building electric industrial cars. And for the last 25 years, they've been advocates for neighborhood electric vehicle technology and have been building. NEVs. And their company president is a big advocate. And, um, he's been super helpful in filling in the gaps on the market here. Taylor Dunn uh, is one of the companies that wasn't in, it wasn't in Long Beach, they were in Anaheim. But they really need to be recognized here because they too jumped into the shopping cart craze. Taylor Dunn didn't start out with shopping cars, though. Um, Taylor was, R.D. Taylor, was a chicken rancher in Anaheim. You can imagine when Anaheim was full of chicken ranches. Um, and he realized, after a while being in the chicken ranching business, that he could make more money selling chicken ranches than he could selling chickens. And so he started manufacturing chicken ranch equipment, and we could buy a chicken ranch kit out of the back of a magazine like popular paper cans. And say, you know, want to earn some money? Buy a chicken ranch. And you call up Artie Taylor, or send him a letter, and he would send you the cages and the bins to catch the eggs and everything you needed for your chicken ranch. And as part of that, he built hand carts to deliver the feed to the chickens. And he realized that that was strenuous and tiring, especially if you wanted to sell somebody more chicken ranching equipment. Um, they wouldn't want to push the cart and feed the chickens. So he built an electric cart where you would take the sack of chicken, sack of chicken feed, put it on the front of the cart, you stood on the back. It was controlled by your feet entirely, the steering and speed. Um, and when you got next to the chicken feed trough, you'd poke a hole in the bag and you'd drive along and the feed would pour out into the trough and feed the chickens for you. So he started marketing a motorized version of his chicken feeder vehicle. He uh, produced his first electric truck in 1951 that he used on his own ranch, and then began selling the trucks and other industrial vehicles after that. Then he took on a partner, Fred Dunn, and the company was named Taylor Dunn thereafter. In 1955, Taylor Dunn, in response to the shopping car industry, came out with their own Model PG, a three-wheeled shopping cart, electric power, very similar to an Ottoette. And then in 1959, uh, and they came out with the first fiberglass body shopping cart, the Taylor Dunn Trident. Uh, the Trident was a beautifully finished car, uh, well manufactured. Its, its only real fault was they used plywood to reinforce the fiberglass and as they aged, the plywood would rot out, and the cars would rot from the inside out. Um, they produced two versions of the car, um, a shopping car coupe version, or, or roof version, and it was a fiberglass roof, and it could be removed, and they also produced a little pickup. You can see that in the lower left. These cars were unique in that uh, they not only came with tiller steering, but as an option, you could get a steering wheel. And that was big. Um, they used a, a Mercury outboard motorboat steering wheel as their steering wheel. And they also produced a limited number of four-wheel versions of the car. 
Uh, nicer looking than the electric shopper version with the electric body that had the kind of sinister face. These cars were much more successful. Um, obviously the fins and the eyebrows sort of relate to the Chevrolets of the 1950s. Um, the other thing that the car was available with was hand controls as well as foot controls. Um, if you were infirmed and they offered side windows that were uh, zipped in basically and, or snapped in as a side curtain. After 1963, Taylor Dunn resigned from the shopping car business um, and continued pursuing the manufacture of industrial cars and Taylor Dunn continues to manufacture industrial cars today and uh, in March of 2004 they sold their parts business off to another company but they continue to manufacture industrial cars and if you are ever inclined to go to Anaheim and drive past Taylor Dunn the farmhouse where the first chicken ranch was is still there mm -hmm. on the corner of the Taylor Dunn factory property mm -hmm. and that's where their corporate offices are housed. So we get to the electric king and back to Long Beach. <laughs> Remember that Wilfred Ballard and Thomas Sartre both worked for the electric car company in California. They had experience with the Ottoette company. Um, and in 1961, they went out on their own and created BMZ Electric Car. And they came out with the electric game. Uh, the BMZ Electric Car company started manufacturing their first cars in 1961 in Long Beach, and then later moved to Signal Hill um, for better manufacturing facilities. They were known best for producing the electric cane. They did produce other varieties of cars and some industrial cars. Um, the electric canes were available as well as a quarter ton truck, a half ton truck um, called a Rancho. And the cars were referred to as deluxe or economy coupes, um, depending on the trim. And they also came with a Surrey top, if you want to Surrey top was fringe. Uh, the Model 167 is probably the best known in the, of the early ones because it was a two-seater with tiller steering and kind of followed the model. Uh, and then the big success was the electric cane. Uh, they also used electric cane's basic platform to produce golf buggies and trucks and a number of other <coughs> uh, body designs that were used for airports and for factory use and that sort of thing. There's uh, electric king just like, well, not quite like the one, right? This is another body one. And a couple examples of electric kings. And then this is a later fiberglass model with four wheels. Uh, in 1976, Wilfred Ballard Jr. and Pierre um, bought the company from their father. Correct me if I get any of this wrong. <laughs> and um, after acquiring other marks that were going out of business through the purchase of electric car sales and service, um, they ended up with marks like Mobilet and the Electric Shopper. Uh, the company became the last to sell and service shopping cars in Long Beach. Uh, the company is still in business today. Uh, this is one of the last production cars, um, both the three and four wheel version of the fiberglass body electric king was built. Um, production ceased on these cars in the early 1980s. I believe the last year of production was 83 um, for the cars. Um, however, the company still sells a range of electric carts, golf carts, and NEVs uh, from a Long Beach location on Cherry Avenue, 3850 Cherry Avenue, and through um, satellite dealerships out in um, the Palm Springs, Palm Desert area. So BNC Electric really became the last surviving shopping car company in Long Beach as a result. The electric sports rider um, <coughs> needs to be mentioned as well. And the sports rider uh, again, not a Long Beach company, uh, was built by Kelson Manufacturing, and a guy named Arthur Kelson, um, who was born in 1917, started the Kelson Company in 1961. 
she was kind of late to the game, but, um, but produced a fairly substantial number of cars. The first new electric sports rider was produced in 1963, and it had this signature round nose, and uh, kind of a cute little car. <laughs> and prior to, and Arthur Kelson is one of the few folks who were there at the beginning that I had the, uh, the opportunity to do some great oral history with. And one of the things that he identified that's kind of neat about this car is, is that when he started the company, he didn't have any tooling. And so he had to design a car that could be made without big rolling tooling and things like that to manage the sheet metal. And so the body on this is all hand cut and hand formed. And the bends were done over pieces of pipe in the factory. And they would just push the metal over the pipe to get the round shape. So the round shape was kind of organic. Um, if you park a bunch of these cars side by side, which is kind of rare, but we had a chance one time to do that, but we had several of them, um, almost no two are alike because of that hand-built nature to the cars. The roundness of the nose changes um, from car to car, the slant. Um, it was kind of, in a way, a crude um, attempt at, at the shopping car with a little hand sketch on their sales literature. But they had great success when uh, Ann Margaret's <coughs> husband wanted to surprise her with a gift for a car to run around the lot at the movie studio. And so he engaged famous car customizer, George Barris, to take an electric sports rider and customize it for Ann Martin. And that's the car there. The car was completely covered in gold leaf. Uh, and it had hand carved script details, including Ann Margaret's name on the front. And she absolutely loved the car. And I got a chance to actually interview her about the car. Uh, and when she got out of her studio contract, she took the car home to Malibu, and they used it around the ranch, uh, and eventually it just started to fall apart. Um, but she loved the car, and it wasn't until um, they had to clean out junk and the car had been completely broken down that it was sold for scrap, unfortunately. Um, and they loved it to have found that car. Um, only two variations on the electric sports rider were built. The first being the round nose, the new electric sports rider, which is confusing because then they build this one and they don't call it the new one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they went to the flat front and more of the model of the DZ electric cane. Um, and if you're a casual observer, it's very difficult to tell the two cars apart. Um, the main difference being uh, of the electric canes, they had that wonderful diagonal styling line where the body came together um, that made the car a little more sleek than the Kelson. Um, in 1967, this car was introduced. Um, the company only lasted for four more years. Um, and similar to some of the other companies, the market just evaporated and so they stopped selling the cars. They sold off the electric king interest and the brand to Robert Noakes in 1972. He was from the San Fernando Valley. Um, he purchased all of electric sports rider and primarily built cars from the parts he had at hand uh, between 1972 and 1975. Uh, and then two years later, Noakes passed away and the brand basically just vanished. So what happened to all these cars? and why. And in, it's an interesting story in that Long Beach really did embrace the cars. Here you go, Eric. Um, they were popular. Uh, people loved the cars. They, the city of Long Beach and the community um, made adaptations for them, including the curb cuts, the first curb cuts uh, to drive the vehicles up onto the curbs. They were even driven into stores. Uh, there's a wonderful photo over here in the exhibit of a car being given away as a promotion at a store. Um, but with their popularity, more and more cars appeared on the streets. And with more and more cars appearing on the streets, encounters began to happen, particularly on the sidewalks. Um, for the most part, looking through the historical record, the accidents are grossly exaggerated. 
Uh, most of the accidents were not injury accidents. Uh, there were accidents that did occur where cars, shopping cars were struck by full-size cars. Um, one in Pasadena where the driver was ejected and killed. Um, and a couple here, uh, here's in the Pasadena Star News, uh, the aftermath of a full-size car and an auto encounter. Uh, and then, unfortunately, an accident happened here in Long Beach on the pike. And an elderly woman driving her car on the sidewalk uh, hit a bump and she wasn't holding onto the steering tiller. And the wheel snapped around and the car spun and struck a ladder. And on the top of the ladder there was a sign painter. And he fell and struck his head on the sidewalk and died of his injuries. And that was really publicized. Yeah. And so from basically starting in, in the late 50s, um, the Long Beach Press Telegram, and particularly George Robeson, who was an editorial writer, started uh, writing against the Ottawa, against shopping cars. And they were called a menace and the scourge of the streets. And, uh, and the, he would write, and if you look through the papers, Monthly, he would write a column against the cars. Uh, and that, along with an increasing interest in the regulation of automobiles in general, um, particularly in the state of California, uh, and the regulation of the cars has started to make them less and less popular. Uh, restricting the cars from driving on the sidewalk and in the street, requiring licenses and registration, uh, and ongoing regulation trying to make the cars illegal, uh, basically resulted in ordinances that outlaw uh, the shopping car from the sidewalks and from streets outside of residential areas. Uh, the cars were still real popular in areas like Leisure World, where they had an infrastructure that supported. But if you lived in, in general in Long Beach, trying to get across town to go shopping, it became more and more of a struggle. And because of that regulation, less and less of the cars are being sold. Um, you'll see in the bottom right, um, police prepare Operation Ottawa. Um, <laughs> and in 1971, uh, legislation was passed requiring that you have a full operator's license, vehicle operator's license, uh, and that the Ottawa was subject to vehicle operation regulation. And that was the death knell, basically, of them being used as shopping cars. Um, in some communities, though, we mentioned Leisure World, some communities like Balboa Island um, and over on Catalina, um, they wrote special legislation specifically for the cars. And so in those areas, the cars continue today. Um, and what's interesting is we now see this legislation being moved broader and broader by county and ultimately by state across the country. And the neighborhood electric vehicle has been written back into ordinances all across the country uh, with speed restricted access in most cases, uh, but the cars are catching on. The other thing that's kind of interesting is right at the end, uh, 71, 75, as the cars were declining, the rhetoric basically changed. And in response to gasoline prices, to smog, uh, the papers, the press started to promote the auto went. Um, but it was a little too late. And so the cars uh, declined in use. And as we mentioned with all the history of these companies, they uh, began to decline in their availability to the public. So um, that's a brief history. <laughs> The fellow, I think Custer, you know, and when he was the balloony, yeah. and you said something about he printed something? Yeah, well, he, how did he, do that? he took a printing press oh. up in the balloon, yeah. and, along with a passenger, to operate the press. And they actually printed a copy of a newspaper, a special balloon copy, okay. and then they distributed the paper by dropping them from the balloon. Okay. Um, and the other thing is, what did they do? 
how did they, I, they didn't recycle them, so what did they do with those uh, batteries? Um, well, with the batteries for these cars, they were early mm -hmm. lead acid batteries, and actually components of the batteries were recyclable. Oh. Um, but most of them ended up in landfills after oh. after their useful life. Um, battery maintenance and battery charging is a big technical, kind of a big technical story. Each manufacturer kind of took their own uh, approach to it. With a custard car, your charger was a box that hung on the wall of the garage. It was about that tall, about that deep, with a great big vacuum tube in it. Uh, I have one. <laughs> and I made the mistake of trying to actually use it one day, just to see. <laughs> and all the circuits in my house went. <laughs> uh, but it was, it changed. They, they ultimately came down to a small box about so big that was usually furnished with the car and was external to it, and you could just plug it in, um, much like a plug-in electric car today. Uh, a few of the manufacturers, including B&Z, uh, also put onboard chargers in the cars, usually under the trunk, and, uh, and then you just had an extension cord that you plug in and plug into the car, and you could charge it like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. on the front table, which is really interesting to look at. And I understand that someone brought an electric car here today. Oh, cool. What is <laughs> and it? It's, no, what, is, what is it? It's an automatic uh, cruise out. Oh, cool. Huh? Huh? And it's, um, if you go down the hall, past the restrooms, then uh, parked in our parking spaces. Um, I'd like to um, invite you all to come to our next program in the series, which is featuring um, Charles Phoenix at the Long Beach Petroleum Club on January 12th. And on February 2nd, we have a program uh, called Legends of Lions, where we have Don Prieto coming, and hopefully Tommy Ivo's car. Steffi Hans is organizing that, and uh, so that will be right here in the gallery in a few um, buy your tickets online. We'll be sending reminders about both of those events. Um, and if not, leave us your email address. So, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.